we had the great pleasure of co-directing this incredible group of youngsters. Um, Tamara's going to talk a little bit about this process and how we created this show. So what's amazing <coughs> is that we've only been together as a group for a week. And the students didn't even get what roles they were playing until Tuesday. So they rehearsed Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And now they're performing on Friday. And the extraordinary collaboration and support that they have given each other has been really amazing. And these are stories that we are so proud to tell. Some of, uh, some of them are authors. Some of the authors are in the audience. No one's telling their own story, though. Everyone is stepping into the shoes of another Scriber student in order to tell their story. And, um we just want to give a few thank yous. Um, first of all, um, to Margie and to Dave, who are the teachers that were part of this project. We give them a round of applause. <laughs> also, this is such a wonderful partnership of great organizations. We want to thank Seattle Public Theater and Shauna and Ali and Kenna for um, hosting this and creating this collaboration. So we give them a round of applause. And then we also just want to thank you all, the Scribers community. Um, Samara and I are always amazed at the community that we walk into. You guys have something very, very special at your school. Um, it's a, what we've noticed is that it's a space of support and acceptance and holding up of each other's stories and hardships. And it's really inspiring. So we just ask that you bring that energy to this performance with your silent focus. Um, obviously, if you have a reaction, have a reaction, but um, give your full unvited attention to the performers on stage. <coughs> if you could also take a moment to silence your phones, it would be really great if there weren't any phone interruptions. The other thing to note is not only not having the phone ring, but also not texting during the show because you're in the dark and we're in the light. What that means is that when, a, when somebody's texting, their cell phone lights up their face and you're like a little beacon uh, for the actors to stare at. So make sure that it's silent and put away throughout the entire performance. So without further ado, please give a round of applause for I Am Finally Awake. Kylie told me stuff about you and your mom. My heart drops to the bottom of my stomach and I feel like I'm going to throw up. What did she tell you? But I don't really want to know. It's been four years now and anything to do with my mom still affects me deeply. She said that you used to beat up your mom all the time. Is that true? Did it even look like I was defending myself? Does everyone just think I fought her for telling me to clean my room? All other people remember is when she was not herself because she wasn't herself when she was drinking. The only memories I want to keep of her are the ones when she was happy, like the moment on Christmas Eve four years ago. My mom struggled down the stairs, gripping the side rail. I watched, embarrassed. Her tights making her slip, but she made her way to the couch. She had taken her heels off five minutes after we arrived to celebrate Christmas Eve. I wondered if I should go upstairs to get away. She drank more when she got nervous, and she was never more nervous than when she was in front of our family. Hi, baby. She reeked of perfume. The mouthwash on her breath was a sad attempt to cover the alcohol. Then she noticed my cousin's new hat. That is just so cute. Where did it come from? Everyone was smiling and laughing. A yule log flickered on the TV. We probably looked like a family from a Hallmark commercial. I've been looking for one just like that. Merry Christmas. <laughs> it's so cute. Thank you so much. I hadn't seen her that happy for a long while. She loved it. It was pretty embarrassing, but I was happy. Okay, let's talk about something else. I want to be happy with you. Me too, but I can't stop the thoughts. I can't focus on anything else. What would have happened if I had just let her hit me? Would she have been the one to get in trouble or arrested instead of me? 
What if I had tried to keep her alcohol away from her? When I was younger, I didn't know. But eventually, after all the times I accidentally mistook her drink in the fridge for mine, I knew. At an early age, I learned to smell my drinks first. Hello? It was my dad. Allie? Why was he there on a Thursday? He usually only came over on the weekends. Why was he at my house? What? I need you to come home. Now. Why now? You just need to come home. Why? Why, why, why? Allie, your mom passed away today. That's not funny. How could he say that to me? Was he trying to hurt me? How dare he? I'm serious, Allie. I still didn't believe him. I just tried to not let it bother me. To ignore it. Okay, I'll come home. My head was spinning. My hands shook, but I wasn't cold. What made him say that? Maybe he was trying to make what really happened sound not as bad? He always did that. Bad news, then good news. To make the bad news not so bad. I was mad. Mad at her. Mad at him for saying that. Mad for what I said yesterday. There's no way he's serious. This wasn't real. It was a dream. I had this nightmare before, and it always felt so real. But this time, it didn't feel real at all. Why would Tyree say something like that? The thoughts in my head exhaust me. My mom always told me to never go to bed angry, never hang up the phone without saying I love you, never leave without saying goodbye. You never know. What if I die tomorrow? What if that was the last thing you said to me? We yelled over one another. I would have said anything to get her off the phone. Why won't you come home? I like it here, and people aren't drunk all the time. I'm tired of your excuses. You live here, you need to come home now. I'll come home tomorrow, maybe. I don't know. You don't get to tell me whether you are coming home or not. I don't want to live there. I don't like it there. You need to come home now. I could hear the alcohol on her breath. You don't have a choice. I hate you. I'm never coming home. I hung up the phone. Whenever she was drunk, I felt like she didn't care about me. Why should I care about her? I go to sleep with every night. I wish my last words to her would have been, I love you. Writing my story has been very hard. I chose to go through this process because I wanted to experience the healing and support that previous scriber writers talked about. It worked. Writing this helped me deal with guilt and acceptance more than any counselor in the past four years has. My mother's death came after a year of conflict. I didn't expect to graduate because I never went to school. When my mom died, Everything fell apart. Thanks to the help of my friends and family at Scriber, I am currently on track to graduate this year. Every day is a new day, and one by one, I'm working to make my mother proud of me. I love her with all of my heart, and although I may not have told her that, I still move forward every day for her and because of her. I thank her for all that she gave me. <coughs> It's a text from Alex, the 17-year-old I've been with for almost three months. My stomach turns from excitement. I'm with my best friend, my partner in crime, and we're excited to be hanging out with older guys. Two windows down, my grandma's lights are still on. She never notices I'm gone, or maybe she doesn't care. I've been sneaking in and out for almost three months now, and after stumbling and drunk many times, many times, I'm almost positive she knows. Yet she pretends not to. She probably doesn't want to believe her 13-year-old granddaughter's already sneaking out. Claire takes off her heels and jumps down out of the window quickly. When I see his truck, a different type of adrenaline hits me. He's never hit me in front of a friend. But tonight will be fun, though I can't get what happened a month ago out of my mind. I was walking down a silent road somewhere in Everett, drunk, tired, and with blistered feet. It snowed two days earlier. 
I called Claire at least ten times, but it kept going straight to voicemail. I couldn't call a taxi without my wallet, and it was 2 a.m. I wouldn't be able to catch a bus until at least six. The last thing I wanted to do was call my grandma and have her see me, have her pick me up dressed up like I was, smell all the alcohol on my skin, and see the fresh bruise coloring my collarbone. I needed to get home and get my tattoo concealer on it. Alex had bought me the tattoo concealer after the first time he hit me. He had taken me shopping as a way to say. I'm sorry. It will never happen again. He spent hundreds of dollars on me, and when we got to the makeup store, he showed me the tattoo concealer and whispered. Look, babe, this will cover it. I don't want anyone to think I beat you up. He'd been blowing up my phone with texts that said I'm sorry, even though most of them end with the word but right after. I'm so sorry. You know I didn't mean to hurt you. But you know I have anger problems. You know that, baby. I realized my only option. I picked up the phone and I called him. And I told myself, just don't let him apologize. And I've been saying that to myself a lot lately. <coughs> By the time we arrived back at my house, I was back to thinking he was the best boyfriend ever. Everyone has problems. He's a really good guy, and he's cute. He could be with any girl, and he's with me. I just have to be a better girlfriend and be more understanding. Oh, I think he's already drunk. He's wearing an over-the-top amount of Victoria's Secret's men's cologne that I bought him, which is a sign he doesn't want me to smell how much he's had to drink. Almost every time he's hurt me, he's been drunk. But he doesn't have the luck. Alex makes a sharp U-turn and quickly speeds up at 90 miles per hour on a back road. He's blowing stop signs, not caring about his surroundings. I feel a rush. I am not worried about my life or hitting something or how drunk he is. I am just enjoying it. I feel grown up and free. I want to feel like this forever. <laughs> Get off the water. What were you doing all day? You weren't answering my test. He's angry, but he's not at 100%. Babe, my phone died at 2. I couldn't charge it until I was, got home at 6. Then I left him met up with Claire and we were busy getting ready until you picked us up. And you were working all morning. He doesn't say anything. And I can tell by the dead look he gets when he's angry that he's not satisfied. I should have tried harder to let him know what was going on. Take some shots with me. Get in the back with me. I don't want to. I don't feel too good and we're in public. All you ever do is make excuses. You're my girlfriend you just start fucking acting like it. I just don't want to mess around right now. Whatever. You never do. Am I being a bad girlfriend? Do I have to do it with him? Should I do it with him? I'm sorry, babe. I need someone to show me that they love me. You always have excuses. You don't love me. You know I love you. I just don't... His eyes and face are completely blank. You're hurting my arm. Please stop, Alex, please. For a second, my vision is blurry and my ears ring loudly. I lay on the ground, dizzy and motionless. Gravel in between my fingers. When I look up, all I see are these size 11 Jordans walking away towards the water. That night when I fell asleep, Claire took my phone and blocked Alex from everything. Facebook, phone calls, texts, Twitter, and Instagram. When she first told me, I was mad, but quickly realized it was probably the best thing she could have done. I haven't seen Alex since that night. The look I referred to in my story is the warning that he gives you telling you to brace yourself. The look that stays with you forever, even when he's gone. And you can't escape it. When I first wrote this story in ninth grade, I felt this huge weight lifted off my shoulders, and I'm writing it helped me take action for myself. I'm now in 11th grade, and I'm publishing in hopes that it will help anyone going through something like this. <clears throat> Get any worse. 
When everything falls apart, I cry. I cry about everything and anything, and I feel helpless, but I try to work it out. When everything falls apart, I hide myself away. I distance myself from everyone and everything that I love. I allow my grief to consume, and I give up. When everything falls apart, I lose every ounce of hope that I fought to hold on to for so long. I feel defeated. I want it all to end. I allow myself to slip into the deepest abyss of my ever-consuming, darkest thoughts. When everything falls apart, I realize that nothing is permanent, and following that realization is another. If nothing is permanent, I cannot be broken forever, and I begin to pick up the pieces. Look to the future, find all the pieces, put the puzzle together. Make it the picture you want it to be. You're the only one that can. When everything falls apart, I go where my heart is home. And I am safe. I go where I am accepted and loved for who I am. Do you even know why you're here? Don't tell him. Shaylin, are you with us? You can't trust the people here. Shaylin, Shaylin. My eyes fly open and my attention snaps back to the woman in the nurse's uniform. Glory is still standing behind me and I want to hold her hand, but given the situation, I doubt it would be a good idea. I'm here. Why does she have a clipboard Then there's a table to write on right there? Quiet! Let her think, you moron. I don't trust him either, but you're not helping. She's always there to defend me when Lorraine is annoying. Even though I can't see him now, his presence in my mind is annoying. Do you know why they called me in? I'm sure that they he is referring to is the psych ward staff. As to why, they're all worried about my imaginary friends, the voices, the ones that have been there for me the past few years. Well, no. You're a special case. Not everyone experiences the same things you do. I'd like to start from the very beginning. When is the first time you have this special encounter? It's embarrassing. Being so open about it for the first time, I've never opened up to anyone about it, not even my parents. I focused on the clipboard, the chair, the white walls, anything but the specialist. I've never felt exposed like this before, but I know I have to tell her. I take a deep breath before going into it about how it all started back when I was five years old. I sat on my aunt's hammock in the patio. You look bored. I turned the direction of the voice, but I didn't see anybody. I ignored it. Why don't you talk to me? Busy? <clears throat> the name came out of my mouth so naturally. I didn't even have to think. I had never seen her before in my life. How could I know her? By the time my brother Isaac came out, <clears throat> to sit in his hammock, Vizzy had already taken his spot. Isaac, ask her to move next time. Vizzy, are you okay? Who? There's nobody here but us. Everybody else is inside. By the time I was nine, I had Vizzy, Crystal, and Morgan with me. Sometimes I would play with them at recess instead of playing with my classmates. I didn't talk about his friends too. But admitted, you couldn't see or hear them. That they were just people made up. Our parents called them our imaginary friends. I think not last long before I gave up on them. But mine weren't really imaginary. <laughs> we're not harmful. No. It wasn't until a couple years later that they became harmful. They stayed with me all day and all night, never leaving my sight or my dreams. I didn't mind, though. They were there for me when my mom was in alcohol rehab. And my dad had just gotten remarried to my current stepmom. Did your family situation affect your special friends? I'm not sure if it was my family situation or my insanity that affected them. It wasn't until 2012 that they really started changing my life. Can you elaborate? They started telling me what to do. Sometimes it would include hurting other people, or worse.
take you away. You know what? I said we'll take you away, Kat. I didn't recognize this as being a friend. I didn't even recognize them as human. No gender or specific voice. I was confused. Who were they talking to? Who was Kat? You. You're Kat. I'm not, though. I'm Shaylin. You don't have to be Shaylin anymore. You hated you just as much as he would, right? I didn't know why, but something about this being made me want to believe every word that rolled off their tongue. What they were offering was exactly what I had been hoping for for so long. Escape. That being away from my stepfamily, my school, and my mom's absence in rehab. What reason did I have not to accept? So I became Kat. Shaylin was only someone's body that I would be trapped in until my friends would come out and bring me away from wherever I was. Have you accepted who you are? Answering with a yes was probably the worst thing that I could have done. From then on, my mind went numb for about a month. All I could think of were two things. I wanted my mom back out of rehab, and I wanted Gloria and the rest of them to take me away. <clears throat> if you want them to come, you'll have to give something up. What? You know where the scissors are, right? The green ones you keep in the second drawer for the posters you make? What do you want me to do with those? They don't really do much but cut paper. Go get a knife, then. One of those big ones from the kitchen, Cat. It's what Cat would do. You want out, don't you? My hesitation was so visible. I know what you think of, her, of your stepmom and her sons. I've heard what they say about you. I've seen the messages he sent you. You were playing on my weaknesses. I had felt hatred for my stepmom ever since she moved to Washington to marry my dad. I don't know. You were there on the stairs. Don't tell me you've forgotten already. Suddenly, it wasn't that voice that I had heard anymore. It was my stepmom, Marianne's. Mark, she has to go. I know. I'll go talk to her. My dad and stepmom wanted me gone. They wanted me far away from them. I knew it, and so did this thing talking to me. My mind went numb, and all I could think, I couldn't think straight. I remembered a knife, silent tears, the panic every time I made a noise. I blacked out soon, only to wake up next morning with aching arms and a tear-soaked pillow. We have the test results. All I could focus on were the big letters on the graph. They read PSY, 68%, SCH, 98%, MDD, 80%. There are others, but I don't pay attention to them. What does the SCH mean? I know the other two mean psychotic and major depressive disorder. Schizophrenia. When the word leaves her mouth, I let out a breath I didn't know I'd been holding for years. It's not demons, it's not a punishment, and it's not even unheard of. There is a word for it, which means there is a way to deal with it. I finally have my answer. I still have occasional flashbacks of what happened that night with the knife, but for the most part, it's all behind me. I am extremely happy where I'm at right now. In fact. I have never been happier. After opening up about this to more people and writing it out, I was shocked to find that it isn't as off-putting as I thought it would be. I realized it's pretty common. Some people I told were interested in finding out more about what goes on in my head rather than shunning me like I was used to for so long. Another reason I wrote this story is to break the stereotype that people with schizophrenia are noticeably different or completely gone. I have accepted that they are hallucinations, but that doesn't make them any less real for me or anyone who goes through the same thing. As for the future, I plan on graduating early and teaching English as a second language overseas. Hope is your best friend, holding your hand, bringing you back. When she sees that distant, depressed look in your eyes, doing the smallest thing, just to get you to smile again. Hope is inspiration. It helps me get going. 
Hope is alive. Hope is my grandma. She's the most amazing human and the strongest lady I know. Hope is the thought that even though you want to give up, you find something worth fighting for. Hope is your future. Hope is home. Hope is the knowledge that you are doing it all for. Hope is more than anyone could put into words. Hope is that one ray of sunshine on a cloudy day. Hope is what keeps me from cutting, what keeps me going. Hope is what gives me life. Hope is out there. You just have to look and find it. I see the scissors in my right hand and the towel in my left. I stick my left arm out and cry more. Through my sobs and heavy breaths, I sniff the scissors in growing anticipation. The tears drop off my face. I cry, shake, and tighten my fists from the memory of the events that occurred to me. I saw my friend Jacob and tried to catch up with him. Jacob had a lot of friends and was very popular. He and I were really close. But Jacob was standing next to Darren, who was always rude to me. Run! I watched the person I thought was my friend take off without even looking at me. My heart shattered, and I didn't know what else to do. So I walked over to another group of them. You guys? In that moment, I felt like I had no friends. Jacob was smiling and laughing. My soccer teammate Matthew stood next to him. One of the kids took out a bag of baby carrot, opened it up, and threw one. It landed right at my feet. I felt more carrots hitting me all over, my legs, my head, my shoulders. I clenched my teeth so hard I thought they would break and balled my fist so tightly they turned white. Finally, I was so pissed off that I picked up one of the carrots and threw it back. He just kept throwing and laughing. I shut myself in the world again, this time more tightly. I heard a faint thud by my ear and saw a pine cone on the ground next to me. Matthew spit a piece of gum. I seemed to play in slow motion as it flew through the air and landed close to my left leg. They left, they left. I was like, what did it happen? I stood up and found 15 carrots, 20 pine cones, and a piece of chewed gum. Stop thinking about your horrible life. I take the scissors and run them across my bare arm. Little drops of blood appear along the cuts. The drops grow bigger and run down my arm. I press the towel against the cuts and the blood transfers. I shake as I look what I've done and cry, remembering a time when Jacob was the only person at school to help me and care. When I entered the music room after school, Jacob was there. My stomach filled with thousands of butterflies because I worked out the courage to tell him something all day I never told anyone. I felt like I was going to puke. Jacob, I have something to tell you. What is it? Even though I'd only met him a month before, I felt like I could trust him with my biggest secret. I'm gay. Speaking the words lifted the weight of the world off my shoulders. I waited for his response and feared the worst. So, I don't care. That's who you are. I support you. My friends will, too. My breath stabilized and fear cleared from my mind. Thank you for supporting me. You don't know how much it means. I drop the scissors in me as the blood drips onto my sheets. I hear all the names and insults people have said to me over the years. Bad. Cocksucker. Waste of time. Piece of shit. Nobody likes you. No one ever will. You have no friends. I cry harder than I have in a long time. I feel it all alone in the world. The darkness surrounds me. I fight the ongoing battle with little strength I have left, even though I've already lost. Where am I? But I get no answer. Who am I? All the people who are bullying me walk out of the shadows. You're all alone. No one will miss you. No one cares. You are all alone. No one will miss you. No one cares. I am lost, never to return. I sit alone in the dark wondering what will happen next. The darkness is depression. Depression is me. After this happened in 8th grade, I continued cutting for a year. It got so bad I went to the hospital for trying to kill myself. When I got out, I made a vow to never cut again. Because I was not happy in the hospital, I didn't want to go back. This is a struggle I continue to fight as an athlete. But being at Scriber has helped me, because I have people who care about me and understand where I'm coming from. When I came here, I was sick and tired of hiding my true self, so I came out and everyone was supportive and nice about it. I decided to write this story so people know that they're not alone in their struggles. And I want people who read this to never give up like I almost did. <coughs> I have renewed strength and I'm currently winning against my depression. I'm finally awake from the sleep that depression is.
I'm fighting my DNs for my grades to motivate myself to graduate and go to college. I'm fighting. I have been since sixth grade. I'm fighting myself. It's a constant battle. My head never shuts up. I'm always fighting with myself to find a black or white. I can't find the gray area. I will fight for everything I love with all my corporeal and spiritual being has to offer, and I will win. I'm fighting for happiness, aren't we all? I'm fighting for freedom, happiness, loyalty, aren't we all? I am fighting to break out of my shell, to keep myself going. I see the way out and I have to keep fighting if I want to reach out and grab it. I know it awaits at the end of this. Another fight that I'll have to fight, but I'm determined, I'm determined to go start it soon. Because I know that my next fight, I won't have to go through it alone. I am scared. I am fighting the world for my sisters, for my family. I need his love. I need to give him every ounce he fucking deserves. Leave the past. Be realistic. Smart. Keep fucking fighting. If he's your glass of wine, save time. Choose the tea. Save yourself. Can't you see? Can't you see what he's doing to you? Can't you see you need to love yourself? Can't you see you're allowing this? It just makes me so angry. Just listen to me. Don't take care of him any longer. Take care of yourself. Love yourself first. We are fighting for the right of love. Self-love. Selfless love. Love. This hospital bed smells like homeless people. This is the last place I want to be. The breathalyzer tells me my blood alcohol content is 0.218, but all I want is another shot of cheap bottom shelf vodka. I know I'm dying. I haven't pooped like a big girl in six months. I've been vomiting everything I try to drink or eat for about three months now. I know I'm putting poison in my body, but in order to keep sane, I must keep doing it. Being here means I'm trying to live. I've never tried life. I've never given myself a chance. But I'm not convinced I have any chances left. I was getting endless text messages from my coworker. With each one, I could clearly imagine her compassionate eyes as I explained to her my thoughts of suicide and lack of hope that life could ever get better. She was sending links to treatment centers and websites. People who could get you the help that you needed. There was a moment when I finally had enough alcohol in my system to make the first phone call. Sorry, your insurance was denied. I felt like I called a million phone numbers after that, telling each person on the other end my age and how much I was drinking, and hearing the sound of pity in each voice. Sorry, we aren't able to help you. Sorry, your insurance was denied. Sorry, your insurance was denied. Sorry, we aren't able to help you. Sorry, we aren't able to help you. Sorry, your insurance is tonight. The death sentence weighed heavier on my heart. It gave up on calling and went back to drinking. Hello? Kelly? Next week we expect to have a bed open. And now I'm here. Kelly, we can't give you any more meds because you're three times the legal limit. Let's get you TV tested, your blood drawn, and a shot of thiamine. I want nothing to do with his needles. I figure this getting sober thing is going to be a bunch of stuff I don't want to do. Relax. Some of my friends use needles. For heroin, they describe it as the worst thing they've ever done. But the best feeling they've ever felt. I never thought I'd be able to push past the fear that kept needles out of my arms. But the shot he just gave me didn't feel the way I always predicted it would. My heart fills with a new fear. Not being afraid of needles means it will be 100 times more difficult to stay sober after this week-long detox. To get out of my own head, I ask, what can I do besides lay here? You can go to the movie room and drink some coffee in the game to the TV room. I walk directly across the hall. Sitting there is a man who looks as if he's dying. You want to play a game or something? No. The intake nurse told me I'd be the youngest person here, but I had no idea this is where people come to die. 
I wonder what my mother is doing right now. She's probably heartbroken that her drinking buddy is throwing in the towel. When I told her I wanted to get help, she tried to convince me not to go. Well, I think I'm going to die like this. Oh, well, honey, don't worry. I'll clean the mobile phone the same when I get home tonight. You'll feel better in no time. She knew how much I was drinking and was so convinced it was the mold that was causing all of my health problems. She was always there when I woke up holding out a shot glass for me. She knew it was the only thing that made you tick. I think about my dad and the last thing he said to me. You know rehab is for quitters, right? He turned up as he handed me sixty dollars in exchange for me. His tears showed or showed he was aware of the damage he had caused. He was probably sitting alone in the dark room smoking crack right now. As soon as I get out of here, I'm chugging the fifth fireball in the trunk of my car. My stupid dad searched my car and found my heroin. The fucking asshole kept my stash for himself. <coughs> I'm here, though. Oh, what's up, dude? You mind, what's up? There are four different types of people in this room, including me. And I hate all of us. I normally hate myself. But being classed with these guys makes me feel like the scum of the earth. What time is it? It's about two. Wow. You guys, what's your name? I'm Kelly. What are you in for? I'm an alcoholic. I had said this before, but only to justify how much I was drinking. I had never spoken these words admitting defeat. It felt good to finally tell the truth. Alright, listen to me. When they ask you for your pain level, you tell them it's like an 8 or 9. Same with anxiety. You hear me? I don't really understand what he's talking about. I look over at the other boys and see they're sniffing the hand sanitizer. Dude, you know you could drink that shit if you mix it with water? Dude, I'm gonna go grab your shot glasses. No, man, I'm going sober. You know that, bro. Should I ask to join them? Or join Gus and be a lame sober kid? I'm truly torn because every fiber of my being is telling me I should continue trying to find ways to escape myself. I decide I've got enough alcohol in my system to avoid the hand sanitizer. For now. You have to mix it up real good. I'll watch this guy and he'll try it. He can throw up everywhere. Don't get yourself in trouble, man. Is this good enough? Dude, I don't know. Try it. Let's party. Let's party. My idea of a party is a half gallon of vodka and some headphones. <laughs> a party is when getting loaded is still fun. And it hasn't been fun for me for a while. It's more of a chore, really. How's your pain level? Remembering what Gus told me. I'd say like an eight. Anxiety level? My fear level is rising as my blood alcohol content falls. My security blanket is slowly melting, but I don't know how to properly communicate this. I can't take this! I want to go home and drink! Why am I here? Okay, we're going to get you some meds and some dinner. He hands me a pill cup with five different pills in it, all different shapes and sizes. Seems like a good time to me. I knew Gus had my back. I take them all at once. I don't even think to ask what they are. Bro, she's a savage. How about you go take a nap now? It's gonna get better. I'm not tired. It's not gonna get better. How can you say it'll get better? Kelly, I'm gonna take a blood pressure now. I hate when the nurse is waking me up. Seems like it's every five minutes. So. What are your plans after this? Have you looked into any treatment centers? No, I have to leave and go back to work. I have a life, you know. I know. I just thought I'd bring you this so you could look into it in case you change your mind. He sets a pamphlet down on the table next to me as if I will actually read it. When I open. 
open my eyes again. There's no nurse, but there is someone sleeping in the other bed. Do you want to play a game? No. I remember I asked him this before. Where is my mind gone? I returned to my room. I think the new girl is dead. No one wants to play games in this stupid place. I'll play. She signs at the fact that it's battle shirt, but she's willing to play. Damn it, what drugs are they giving me? I feel stupid. I'm not too sure. I don't even like taking ibuprofen. Just, I'm going straight to treatment after this. She sounds certain that she can stay sober if she goes to treatment. A foreign thought occurs to me. Maybe I should go. And then two familiar thoughts. <laughs> That's a stupid idea. Sounds like a waste of money. I wake up again. Extra groggy. An angry police officer walks briskly past me. He's looking for me. Why can't he see me? I realize it's just another hallucination. Are you Kelly? Yes, why? I need to take your blood pressure. I'm the night time nurse. My name's Paul. I extend my arm. I feel like I've done this a million times. It's getting a little better. I don't know how he knows this since I've never met him before. His little blood pressure card thing must have some of my records on there. So, can you read me my little results? Oh, no, no, no. I'm not authorized to do that. Come on, it's late. No one will even know. Plus, it's my liver. I think I have a right to know. Well, I suppose I could. I'm surprised. That was easier than I thought. This can't be right. How much have you been drinking? I don't know. I buy a half gallon a day. Not really sure what happens to it, though. I've only seen one person as bad as this. She was 45. She's dead now. Tell me the numbers. 272. I don't know what that means. It means you can never have another drink again if you want to live. I began writing this story in the detox center, carrying my notebook with me throughout treatment. Writing has been a huge part of my life. Since I published in Scriber's 2012 book, You've Got It All Wrong. So I knew as soon as I stepped into detox, whatever happened next would be an experience I could use to help others in the same situation. I'm currently working on my own book, and this is the first chapter. Waking up did not come easy. The real work started when I began to rebuild my life. The funny thing about waking up is looking back and realizing how asleep I really was. The closer I stay to consciousness, the closer I stay to happiness. Sobriety has been good to me. I'm currently working with teenagers with special needs and hope to one day further my education. Oh. 
all this time I have been lying, oh, lying in secret to myself. I've been playing star on the farthest place on my show, Daddy. No matter where you are, or who you are, there is always a solution for whatever is causing you to suffer. Wherever you are, is a good place to start. Wherever you are, is a good place to start.